right. You're listening to Hawk Talk. I'm here today with Marcellus Wiley. How you doing, man? Oh, I'm doing great. Ah! I used to do that when I played a lot. I used to give the sounds. I don't even know if a hawk makes that sound, but ah! Yeah, we do that. Oh, 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 oh. I should have played with you. You yeah. sound better than me. Exactly. Oh, that's great. <laughs> I, I have to be. I think I'm dedicated to the hawk. But uh, Right. So to take it all the way back, I assume the day you're born, you come out, you start guarding your mom, start, you know, tackling some people in the delivery room. It just started from day one, right? Oh, no, it didn't, man. Um, as the story goes, as I was told, uh, my first year of life, I spent 99% of it in the hospital. Oh, wow. I was born with asthma, born with bronchitis, Wow, just had complications. So my first year, hanging on for dear life, they said. Yeah. Uh, so that comes back to haunt me a little bit later in my life and career. But uh -huh. yeah, my first year, not much time at the crib and not much time in the crib. I was at the hospital. And also not the starting story of a top athlete generally with about a long no. time. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, look, I had some DNA that kicked in a little bit later, but at the yeah. beginning, at the offset, it was some complications. I had yeah. to fight through it. And so, and where were you born? I was born in Dominguez Valley Hospital in Compton, California. There you go. And stuck around. So born in Compton. What were your parents' vocations? What did they do when you came into the world? My mother had my older sister at 17, had me at 19. So okay. let's just say she wasn't doing much other than raising two kids as a teenager. Yeah. Uh, my father at the time, I think he worked at a gas station and like, you know, the clerk in, in there with the little mini mart. Yeah. And then they, they journey on to become postal employees. My mom, a carrier, uh -huh. and my dad, a clerk, nice. a supervisor. And so early days, early childhood, you know, we you, you start to get to that four, five, six. Most kids have that, I'm going to be this when I grow up. Like, what were you into as a younger kid? At four, I only have like one memory. <laughs> I wore a big suit at my graduation from like pre-K. Yeah. I remember that. And I was like, oh, that's cool. Big butterfly collar. Uh, nice. Five very few memories. Uh, my first thoughts and memories were really of uh, riding bikes, uh, racing, L love to run and just challenge anybody to a race uh -huh. and just hanging outside, like really just general peace, love, just hanging around people. I just love right. that. So those are my early memories. I, I take it, obviously, when the lung issues when you were a baby, those went away after, like, as you started to become a toddler and everything, like you were able to run fine and all that was okay? Yes and no. Like, I was able to outwardly, everyone said, wow, he's an amazing little athlete. Look how fast he is. All that. I got all the love uh -huh. and attention early. But internally, I didn't know at the time, but I was still struggling. Uh, yeah. I had some heart issues, irregular heartbeat. Uh, mm -hmm. Basically, I had to do EKGs and uh, uh -huh. the, the VO2 test just to sign up for Pop Warner football. So I had some complications and had asthma throughout my entire career. Got it. And still were able to push through. And so, yeah, when, let's get into that. Like six, seven, like when did you start? You, you said you like to run. When did you start really like playing sports and getting into, you know, whether it was football or what was the first thing to really attract you to sports in general? Yeah, the first sport I ever played was golf. Okay. And I'm five years old. It's 1979. And I'm at Rancho Golf Course with yep. my father. And it was my father, Smokey Robinson, Calvin Pete, and myself okay. there. And I remember just the first thing I thought was like, this is interesting. Like, okay. this is a quiet sport. And I'm looking around and I'm like, no one looks like me. <laughs> like, they're just like all white people and all of them old. And I'm like, oh, and they're quiet. And I was like, well, well, yeah, I ain't care. I didn't even know what race was. I was just like, man, kind of weird. And then I hit a 40 foot putt. My dad was over there really working on his golf game. And I'm over there just, you know, I'm hacking shacking. I'm over yeah. there just like, I don't care. Like whatever this is, you know, caddy shack. And then next thing I know, I make it and I run around screaming, ah, like a little kid should. <laughs> and boy, the golf culture looked at me and every one of those old people looking at me. And I thought my dad would come to my rescue. And I remember looking at my dad. And he looked just like all the rest of them. <laughs> like, dude, <laughs> wrong sport, wrong culture. Yeah, yeah. And that, that was the first time I had a memory in sports. Nice. And by the way, side note, you just dropped that in there. How did that happen with Smokey Robinson? Like, what was the connection there? Uh, no connection. It was just like, all right, who's that guy? My dad was talking to him because it was yeah. like, that's Smokey Robinson. Yeah. And two, it was like, hey, it's only like three brothers here. So, like, you know, hi. You know, one of those <laughs> brother nods. Uh, yeah. And I, that's all I remember. And you fast forward like 30, 40 years, 
Smokey Robinson's my neighbor. I was cracking up like, oh, man, you don't remember me when I was five. But yeah. yeah, it was just that kind of connection. I love that golf changed my mindset and perspective immediately. Like I wasn't planted in NBA basketball or NFL football. I was planted in a golf culture that taught me a different way of looking at sports. Yeah, that's that's. And so that was five years old. Did you like really start playing a lot or like what was were you drawn to that sport for a while? Or is it like you just have that memory and played a little bit here and there? Yeah, I, I still play to this day. Um, I don't practice. I play. So therefore, I'm not great, but yeah. really good. Got muscle memory. I yeah. love the sport. Um, it's just that de- you got to dedicate too much time to it. Yeah. It's too fickle. Uh, that's one woman that will never, ever be faithful to you golf. So I'm like, nope, no thanks. But uh, yeah, uh, but, uh, I, I was just a guy who really looked at myself and said, man, what can I do? And I knew I was fast and that was the only thing. So any sport that I could, that would allow me to run, it was a sport I was going to participate in. Yeah. And so did that, do you go straight from golf to football? Like what, what took your attention from? <laughs> no, yeah. you try to get the football fast. No, I'm, nope. I'm trying not no, to. No, I no, I'm I'm messing with the you. <laughs> uh, football. I think football, I was playing football in the front of the house. Like, okay. you know, car, yeah. street light to street light, car to car. Yeah. And I kept diving on cars and catching the ball. <laughs> I kept outrunning everybody. I wasn't scared of the bushes. I run into yeah. the bushes. And I was like seven. Everyone was like, damn, you fast. And damn, you crazy. Like, you yeah. need to play football. And I never thought that what I was doing in front of the house was actually an organized sport and activity. Yeah. Like, you could go down to the local park and go do it. Yeah. So then my friend was actually on the football team, Dominique Walker. And he was like, dog, you got to go play in Inglewood. I was like, all right. So then I went to my mom and dad, said, hey, let me sign up for football. They said, as long as your grades stay as great as they are, and how much is it? And I was like, $65. Woo! They looked at me and like, all right, you better start selling candy. So I started selling candy, got my registration fee. Next thing I know, I signed up for football and I was on my way. Nice. That's awesome. And so to take a step back, like before that, what was, you said golf, what, what else were you into? What other sports? Like where were you thinking like, I want to be an athlete? Like a lot of kids dream of what they're going to be as an adult. Were you, did you have those at six, seven? Or were you kind of like, I'm just having fun? No, I, unofficially, I was running track because everywhere I went, I was just race. I don't care yeah. who you are, yeah. what you were, like what age I'm racing you and, and let's yeah. go. So I was like an unofficial track athlete. Yeah. Um, I didn't start off with the mindset of being a pro athlete. I started off with the mindset of I don't like my neighborhood fully. I don't like these circumstances. I don't like being poor, but more than being poor, more than the gangs and the drugs and, and that poverty. I didn't like how people were acting and aiming. I I hated the low ambition. I just immediately, the first thing I realized was like, man, everybody around me seems so talented and they could do so much. They're funny. They're entertaining. They look like they're dedicated. And I'm like, but I'm listening to what they're talking about and I'm listening to what they have going in their life. And no, no one has a career. I don't know any CEOs. Like no one runs anything. Like everybody was just on the edge. Everyone was, like at their wits end. And Mm -hmm. that's why I thought everyone was so mean at times or violent. And I was just looking around like, dog, what's wrong? (laughs) Like, like, I I would walk into the store and I see somebody yelling at another kid. I'm like, why is that lady yelling at her son? Don't, don't touch that. Put that down. And then my mom looking at me like, don't you grab anything? I'm like, wait a minute. Why am I in here if I can't have anything? Like, you know, I just kind of noticed that dynamic and I was on a mission to get up out of there. And where do you think that came from? Like, was it just naturally you noticed it? Because like, why did you notice that and other people didn't? Like, where do you know where that came from? Yeah, you know, look, I think other people do notice it, but it takes a, an amazing discipline to to carry that through, carry yep. that out. For me, it wasn't it wasn't hard to find. I, my mother was a straight A student. She was uh-huh. six foot one, like 170, 180. She's like a model. And she was this teenage mom. And I was like, eh, nothing wrong with raising us, but there's more in you than there's just what you're doing right now, mom. Mm-hmm. Uh, my dad, you know, very principle based. Uh, man, j- life was right or wrong, black or white. My dad didn't care. And I was like, man, but all you do is root for the Cowboys and go to work. And I was like, eh. I was like, there's more to it. I just thought that they were two amazing people. And when I wrote them down, it didn't sound amazing. I was like, I know you are. You know you are. But you're not showing them you are. And you're not showing the world you are. So that was my mission. That was the seed planet, looking at two incredible people not exactly having incredible lives outside of the love we had. 
Yeah, makes sense. And so, and how old were you when that started really quick? Were you six, seven, eight? Yeah, yeah. six, seven, eight. Uh, I started to have those inner body experiences. Everyone was talking about outer body. No, nah, I was going inside. I was like, there's there's power in here. Like yeah. out there is just items and objects and material. I'm like, in here is all I need to go out there and get it. And everything that's out there is already in here. I'm going to go find it. Love it. And so you get convinced to go play football, sell some candy, start doing it. Were you like the best on the field day one? Oh, no. And it hurt my feelings. <laughs> oh, man, I get recruited. Like, that's an unofficial recruiting trip. Yeah. When a guy says, hey, you need to play for my team. I'm like, all yeah. right. And I get there. I'm the fastest kid in the neighborhood by far. And I'm seven. I'm racing 10, 11 year olds, smoking yeah. them. Everybody know I'm coming. And I get out there. And little did I know, they say, line up, our coach Smith, line up. And he had the whole team lined up. So let's say 50 kids. Yeah. And I love this. This is my moment to shine. And he says, on my whistle, everybody takes off to the fence. I get to the fence and I look. I couldn't believe it. Somebody was at the fence before me, with me. His name was Stace Bozeman. Now, for anybody that knows athletics, they know there is a living legend, a childhood prodigy. His name was Stace Bozeman. I happened to just land on the team that Stace Bozeman's on. And I had no idea who he was, but I was like, good this he turns out to be the high school number one football player in the country usa today wow. and number two in basketball so he was a stud from yeah. hello so other than him i was the second best player yeah <laughs> but that's how it goes i mean it, it, there's always someone better it, like there it, there's ne and even when you get to that point of being the best it only lasts for a short period of time before someone comes back and takes that from you it's it's an interesting lesson to learn at seven but <laughs> um, it's just right. part, of, part of it. And so he's faster. But then when you start to play, like, again, as you said, you didn't know this was like an organized thing. This was just something you did in the street in front of your house. What, how, how did that feel? Did it click right away? Like, I love this. Or was it kind of like, oh, this is a fun thing to do. Like, how were your feelings towards football right in the beginning? Yeah, my first thoughts were, this is really fun to do. And then it started to morph into more like, uh, I started to get esteem from it. At first, it was just like, oh, this is great. And I'm really good at it. And I like it. This is fun. But I was more with the group, more with the team. Like, yes. I, I, I had the second most touch. Everything Stace was number one. I was number two in everything. And I was his fullback. So I uh, thought that was a great life lesson to learn because you never forget that moment that you were a silver medalist, even though you're supposed to win gold. So I always kept that with me. But then it turned into like, nah. You're the guy because Stace the next year goes to a different team. He moves up. Yeah. Basically, it was too easy for him. So he moved up. He said, let me go up there and get a bigger challenge. Yeah. It's my team. And then all of a sudden, it wasn't me saying it was my team. Everyone else was like, it's on you. And I was like, wow, this is how Stace must have felt last year. So I would carry the team or at least lead the team. Let's say that I would have four or five touchdowns every game. Yeah. I would get the ball all the time. And I started to love it. I was like, wow, this is fun. But it didn't go to my head. It went to my work ethic. It was like, okay, so that means I can never lose in practice. I got to win every win sprint. I got to make every play. And some would call that anxiety, but I thought it was showing me what dedication looked like, what real high-level discipline looked like. So I learned to build a hardware and an engine that other kids weren't building because they weren't being counted on or exposed or thought of in that same way. So, you know, because people thought of me highly, I tried to meet those expectations and then now I was off to the races. And was it also like, there's gotta be a like positive feedback loop too. Like you're able to score four or five touchdowns a game. You're beating everyone in these win sprints. So it encourages you to keep pushing, keep going because you're getting the reward for it. You're getting the outcome. Um, yeah, I loved it. I, every kid that would walk by, they'd be like, oh, that's number three. Or they'd say, oh, no, that's the guy. And, you know, and I was like, yeah. dang, that's cool. And yeah. then older people would grab me and they would say even more flattering things. That was great. That's awesome. And so you did Pop Warner. And then is the next step to go into high school? Or what? I actually don't know the progression. Yeah, yeah, you're right. So yeah. uh, I played Pop Warner from eight to like 14. Yeah. And I, I leave there. And then I, I'm getting recruited to go all these high schools. Yeah. Uh, like every time I would go somewhere, a coach would grab, hey, hey, how you doing, Wiley? Uh, what are you thinking about going to school next year? I'm like, I, I don't know. <laughs> you know, that. And I end up going to high school. And another setback actually changes my mindset, uh, my perspective. I got Osgood Slaughters, which is basically a precursor to 
you're about to get really big. You're about to grow, go through a growth spurt. But my knees were, oh, they were just in pain all the time. I'm in the ninth grade ice in my knees every single day. And I was super awkward. It's like, you know, a baby giraffe phase. And I lost a step or two. I was still fast, but I was not the guy that they were expecting. And that setback changed my vision in terms of what I should look at in life from the football field on it and off it. And how to do that? Like, what, what did that make you? How did it make you rethink things? Yeah, it just showed me how fickle sports were. Yeah. It showed me that I shouldn't be a football player. I should play football. It's yeah. a means to an end. It's like, do not let this game absorb you. Don't let your identity be wrapped up in it so much that you don't think there's anything else in this world because it could be gone like that. Yeah, and it was go it felt like that for me. Like, wait a minute. Like to be the guy to this another one of the guys, that was a huge setback for me. So I always was focused on my academics as much as my athletics. Yeah. But now I wasn't just focused on it, I was counting on it. Like this is gonna take me even further than my athletics. Cause if I'm great in football, I'll make it to the NFL. But then I could play three years, the average, yeah. 10 years, whoever. Whatever the number is, then what's next? Yep. And I was like, that's what's next. So yep. I focused in. No, that's got to be helpful. I mean, so many, I know so many athletes struggle with that, where again, if the average is three years, you have this whole dream of hitting the NFL, you hit it, you get it for three years, and exactly, then what? And most people don't have that event that causes them to think past that. Seeing it a yeah. lot. So Yeah, you do. And so how long did it take you to ninth grade? You've got that, like everyone, awkward phase. <laughs> what, how long did it take you to really get back into the swing of things and get your sort of... Man, I mean, it was, it was a slow growth. I, I was growing like an inch or two every year, 10, 20 pounds. But if you were around me, it was subtle. But if you went away and came back a year later, like, whoa. But... I, I didn't hit my stride until I was like a junior in college. Oh. Uh, my mother was 6'1". Yeah. And at this time, she's bigger now. She's like 220, 230. Yeah. And I'm in college after high school, and I'm smaller than my mom. So yeah. my coaches used to clown me and be like, dude, we recruited the wrong Wiley. We should have got your mama. <laughs> like, I'm smaller than my mom as a sophomore in college That's playing football. Exactly. Yeah. That's so it took point. me a while to catch up and get yeah, my stride. And and where'd you end up going? Columbia. You did. And so why Columbia? What, what, how did that come to be? The short is, is the one school that will make everyone assume I was intelligent. Um, I didn't want to be the dumb jock. Yeah. I didn't want to be the dumb black jock from Compton. I didn't want any of them. I, I got tired of like having to prove to somebody that, oh yeah, I was in the spelling bee as well. They're like, yeah. oh, I'm on the academic decathlon team. Oh, I'm a national honor student. Oh, I'm a California Scholastic Federation member. All they wanted to hear is how many touchdowns? And I was like, dog, yeah. okay, yeah, that was great. That's three hours. School yeah. is eight hours. Shut up. I'm like, yeah. all y'all talk about is football. Shut up. So I got tired of just like, just talking about football. I knew too many football players that were better than me that didn't make it. Yeah. So I was like, y'all suckering me into this like cul-de-sac. Yeah. And I hated that. I was like, you're going to make me go all the way down there and I got to turn all the way back. It seems like like, nope. such a, and it's such a valuable perspective, it seems like, because it's the all, as you said, so many people better than you that don't make it and probably don't have a backup plan or something else they're working on. And now what? Exactly. And I was like, nope, my mama and my dad, amazing talents. They didn't realize their full potential. I'm going to realize my full potential. So I wasn't going to let them box me in. I wasn't yeah. going to be just a nerd. And I wasn't going to be just the MVP or an athlete. I was going to be anything I wanted to be. And I was on that mission. Love it. And so uh, you said you got your stride junior, senior year. Like while you were in college, like it's just the freshman, sophomore year, where you're like, this is probably the end. Like I'm going to do this. I'm going to go to Columbia. I'll graduate and go do something else. Or like, how are you thinking about it? Yeah, I, I, I really lived this duality. Like I lived in parallel universes. I lived in one where I was going to Columbia to be a school teacher. Okay. And I, I wanted to come back to LA and just teach kids. That was one world. And I was totally fulfilled in that world. Everyone else was beating that world up, stepping on the seeds. Yeah. Ah, that's stupid. You're not going to grade eighth grade papers all your life. And I was like, yeah, you got a point there, but I'm going to go to school and I'll be a principal, guidance counselor, yeah. dean, something. I'm going to work with kids, fork in the road kids. What was it about kids? Why do you want to do that? Because my childhood experience, I realized I was a fork in the road kid. All the dangers of my environment, I've been shot at multiple times, different 
events, different days. I've been on the football field and they shot up my football field while we're doing jumping jacks. So I know you don't have to gangbang. You don't have to be a bad kid for something bad to happen to you. I also know that there's a kid who's smart who gets beat up every day or teased just because they're smart. And I also know there's a kid who's being suckered because he's such a good athlete that you shouldn't focus in on anything else but being a baller. And I was like, I am going to integrate all those experiences as I embody them and then go back to those kids and tell them the real from the fake. Yep. So it was always that world. And then the other world was a helicopter ride straight to the top called the NFL. But I wanted the helicopter ride, but I wasn't going to wait all day for a helicopter that wasn't coming. Yeah. I was going to go back to school and teach these kids. Got it. And so while you were doing the sports side, like, did, as you said, you liked that helicopter ride. Did you feel like that was in reach all through college or those first couple of years when you were getting made fun of and struggling a little bit? Was it like, ah, that might not be the thing that's coming? Uh, I would say it this way. Uh, I knew it was always in reach. Mm -hmm. I, I believe totally in looking in the mirror, not out the window. I'm not blaming Columbia because it's yeah. a lowly program or it's yeah. one double A. Like, I wasn't built like that. I was like, dog, I went to Columbia. I can go to the NFL from Columbia. If I don't, it's because I'm not good enough. That's it. Yeah. Stop talking about coach. Stop talking about all oh, the recruiters. Stop. Ah, shut it. Well, you weren't good enough. from? Because I, I, you know, not to get too on this side, but I feel like so many people and the vast majority of people do blame the situation versus taking right. a personal accountability. And how do you, how did you get to that? How did you become that person that it was like, it's on me? Uh, I think we're actually innately that way. And we get socialized to and conditioned to think, oh, no, you can blame somebody else and it, it can work, right? Like, I think accountability is built into you. You know, yeah. you fall, you hurt. Like, you know that. Yeah. Like, ow, yeah. touch that stuff. Oh, I told you not to touch. Ah, like you feel all of this. But then certain parents, certain situations start to come for you and say, oh, it's not your fault. Yeah. What did Timmy do to you? Yeah. Oh, I could blame Timmy. <laughs> yeah. Now you start blaming Timmy and you're off to the races. I was like, my family, my dad was principal. He was like, yeah. look, did you do it? No? Okay, then well, we could deal with the consequences if it wasn't you or it was you. So I'm just, I'm this always built that way. So it, it gave me the energy and the focus to really go on that mission. So yeah. it was always to me in reach. But there were times where I was like, I don't think I'm going to reach it. <laughs> so I couldn't blame it. It was like me. But then I just persevered and it ended up working. Well, as you persevered, I, and I guess, as you said, you, you knew it was in reach. So is that what kept you going? Because obviously playing top level college football, like you have to be dedicated. As much as you had another plan and you had this duality, you still had to work your ass off to really be a good football player. And was what kept you going, the idea that this could turn into something? Or were you having fun in the process and it didn't really matter? I actually neither. Like, okay. the fact is, like, I'm always like, if I'm going to be there and I'm going to give it the most important thing I have in this world, which is my time, I'm going all in. Like, I've just been an all in or I'm not doing it type of person. Um, yeah. I don't try everything. People do. I don't. I hate art. Like, yeah. I'm not trying to draw. And like, people are like, oh, you look, you, you can't judge me because I don't like to draw. I'm not a fan of classical music. Oh, you're not sophisticated. So what? Like, I don't. Yeah. I like what I like, and I'm going to be great at what I like. Yeah. And if I don't like it, I may have tried it, but certainly I won't be there for the failure. I am on a mission to get the things that I want. So, you know, I order, I order what I know I can eat. And I think a lot of times people want to just appease others or sound so well-rounded that the wheel doesn't turn. <laughs> I'm yeah. like, dog. Smaller, smaller. Yeah, uh, yeah, so I just try. Uh, I stayed at football because I was giving football my time, so I had to give football my best. Yep, love it. And so at what point did you start realizing the NFL was real? Like not just it was a potential, but you're like, oh, no, this is going to happen. Uh, the, the, the smallest moments were when I was working out with NFL prospects because I'm from L.A., so I come back home every summer, yep. and I'm working out with guys who are getting hyped up. And as we're working out, it's all, it's, it's being said non-verbally. Marcellus got us beat. <laughs> but, yeah. but I'm the one that's getting no attention. I'm yeah. at Columbia, but we working out and, and everyone we're working out with and the coaches are like, damn, Wiley, what, what, what you up to? I'm like, all right. So that was the first seeds being planted. The second real one was I got a workout with a regional scout. And this is not that special, but it's something. 
And he goes to every school and all he wants is your height, your weight, and your 40 time. And I do that. And he's like, I remember he looked at a clipboard because he finally added it all up. He was like, he saw how fast I was. He was like, and you this big? He was like, people going to hear about you. And that was it. And then that was in, that was in June of the, my senior year. We come back wow. after summer break. And we have a scrimmage against Dartmouth. And they had a first-round projected tackle, Eric Larson. And he was supposed to go in the first round from Dartmouth. And he was a big, athletic beast. Mm. And I had to go against him. So it's a scrimmage, not a real game. So it's practice-like. And I had to go against him one-on-ones for two reps. And boy, you're talking about scared. Not nervous. Not anxious. Scared. Yeah. Because I was like, if I can't do anything against him, and he's a first-rounder, but he's in the Ivy League, Eh, maybe you shouldn't be thinking too high about this NFL dream. So I did my thing. I beat him the first time. The second time I beat him, but not as well as the first time. And we played a game. And then after walking off the field, someone tapped me on my shoulder. And I remember it. I looked and he was like, hey, how you doing, Marcellus? My name is Mr. Bird. I said, hey, Mr. Bird. He said, yeah, I'm a scout for the Arizona Cardinals. And I have a big mouth. And I'm going to tell everyone what I saw today. That's it. He walked away to the sunset. Oh, man. Next thing I know, I go to practice. Bill Belichick there. Bill Parcells there. Everybody, household names and faces at practice doing like this, just looking at me. I'm like, it's going to happen. It's about to go down. That's awesome. And so you said that was the beginning of your senior year. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Nice. And so tell me about it. So now you're confident you're going to get in. How was the draft experience? So fun, man, because I was playing with house money. Like before the season, I was not on the list. And then when the season started, because of Bird, I was like the bottom of undrafted prospects, like people to look out for, but they're not getting drafted. And I saw my name. And this is like when the internet first was bubbling. So we were going to the library and like look on the computer and was like, oh, they're talking about me on this article, right? It was hilarious. And we would go like every day. And I would just see my name just popping up. Then it would be like at the top of undrafted, then seventh round, then sixth round. And then it got so crazy that it was like a first round projection. So yeah, it was just fun. Like, dude, that was outer body. They're talking about me? Like all yeah. these people out there talk about me. And every week I had the power of influence. I could have a great game. Next thing you know, they're talking about me even more. Yeah. And did you have teammates that were also on their way? Or was did anyone else from Columbia end up going too? How about this full circle moment? I got drafted second round out of Columbia. Yeah. And I wasn't the best player on our team. The best player on our team was Rory Wilfork, a linebacker from mm-hmm. Miami. He could have went to Nebraska, all these big schools. I recruited him to go to Columbia, told him the same story that sold me. And he was so good, but he didn't look the part like I did. I was a model, like 6'4", 280, run a 4'6". Oh, look how cute he is. And then he had he didn't have the numbers, but he had the game. His game was better than mine. I just looked better playing that game. So I got drafted high. He got undrafted to two teams. He went to Arizona first and then Baltimore got released before the season started, decided to go to wall street. He's been killing it ever since. Awesome. So it works out. And you guys still friends, I take it. Oh man. Yeah. I, he was over here the other day playing pickleball. <laughs> like, yeah, like that's perfect. my guy. Yeah. He <laughs> kills it, man. He's a, uh, he's a private wealth investor and financial planner. Uh, all that all that Boston money at SCS. So Tom yeah. Brady on down. He got all them cats. Perfect. Perfect. And so you get drafted second round. Where'd you go first? Buffalo Bills. And Mafia, we, baby. Yeah. And did you grow up a Buffalo? And you, did you grow up a Cowboys fan like your dad? Or what was, what was where did you want to end up? Or did it not matter? Look, in, in fantasy land, I wanted to be a Denver Bronco because I was a Broncos fan. But in reality, I didn't care where. Yeah. <laughs> like, I was like, dog. I'm about to get out of here. I'm leaving the hood and I'm yeah. taking everybody with me. Let's go. Let's go. Like that that was just me. I just wanted to be the guy that like Robin Hood. Like, I wanted to yeah. go to where they were and then bring it all back here and say, look, that's how it is up there. Like, yeah. you know, so I was not a fan of any team but the Broncos growing up. And, and so when you go to Buffalo, I mean, I don't know what your signing bonus was, but obviously the money is absurd. I do. Yeah, it was $500,000. Signing bonus of $500,000. What kind of salary? 
Uh, salary, uh, it was four years, 2.1 million. So yeah, a little so, over half a year. Yeah, 525 a year. So money that obviously you, your family hadn't seen, you hadn't seen, was it, did you go wild with it right away? Was it like, cause you hear these stories about like, I just made half a million dollars. We're going to go buy a bunch of stuff. Or was it like, <laughs> you, you had the education, you had the discipline. How did it go? I didn't go wild. You know, I could go somewhere and you could buy one big thing. I bought 20 little things yeah. that probably added up to one big thing, but I did a bunch of little things. I was like, nope, all I want is that stereo system. All I want is that DJ equipment. Like yeah. the craziest thing, there were two things that were just mind blowing to me. One was the fact that when I went back and I had my signing bonus and I went to cash the check in installment. So my first check was $99,000. Yeah. And ne- obviously I, me and no one in our family has ever seen that. So I go to the same bank that they're used to me cashing $300 checks, yeah. right? And I go in there and I remember handing her the check and she's in autopilot. She's just like, all right, hey, Marcellus, how you doing? Thinking this $300. And as she's filling out the deposit slip, she's like, ah, Marcellus, rich girl. And, and starts screaming <laughs> in the bank and turned around, like turned around, was screaming to the people, Marcellus, got money, got And I'm like, hey, calm down. We on 57th from Chris, y'all, calm down. And I'm laughing, I'm laughing, but I'm really excited. And I did it all on purpose because the feeling it gave me, I wanted her to feel that and be like, yo, that's out there? And I was like, yeah, that's out there. And she was like, oh my God, I'm so proud of you. Every time you used to come in here all sweaty and with the sweatsuit on and looking like you were just a mess, you were building. And look at this. So we were just, we had a moment. But the other crazy moment was walking into like Circuit City. Yeah. And just looking at everything and looking at it like, I can have that. I can have that too. I can have that too. And that. And I don't want any of it. I was like, all I want is one thing. And it was like headphones. And I was like, God, I could have the whole store, but I don't need it and want it. Ah, this is life. So yeah. it, it was an amazing moment. <laughs> and how is, I'm curious on that. Like, how did you, again, so many people, they get this money and they do buy the whole store. They go, now that I can, I'm going to. Where was that discipline coming from that you're like, I could, I don't need any of this shit. I'm just going to get my headphones and I'm good. Yeah, well, because I wasn't in the right store. Now, you didn't ask me when I go to the car dealership. I was like, oh, I want a Ferrari. <laughs> did you buy I, a Ferrari? Oh, did I buy a Ferrari? <laughs> goodness. Like, look, I used to be the kid on the bus stop doing this, breaking my neck. Like, yeah. goodness. Bingo, contact, all those cars. So not this contract. Now, I don't know four-year 2.1. Nah, it was when I got $40 million. Then yeah. I was like, I think I can get a Ferrari. Yeah. I mean, I By the way, I, though, I would say at $40 million, I think that is not an irresponsible choice. If you want a Ferrari, yeah. you can go get a Ferrari. That's what I mean by that is how did you keep that discipline that so many people don't when they fall on this kind of money? The deepest answer I have, the realest answer I have is I'm not living my life for others. Yeah. Like if I want yeah. to impress yeah. people, I'll put on my chains and, you know, the jewelry and the cars and, and like everyone. We're, we can all go out there. And then next thing you know, we could peacock it. I could peacock yeah. like the best of them. Yeah. But ultimately, I care about what I think and what I'm up to. My mother always used to say, you are enough. I'm the lead singer in this group, right? No one else wants to sing? Fine, I got vocals. And I'm going to sing my song. So I don't live my life for others. So no public pressure, social pressure, peer pressure is going to make me go do something I don't want to do. If I don't yeah. want to do it, I'm just not doing it. And that's it. And I think a lot of people let that go. So many people care about what others think to an unhealthy degree. Yeah. I, I care what others think, but I'm trying to impress you. But if you're not impressed, I am. So I'm off. So that's it. Yeah. No, love that. And I think that's super healthy. And so you obviously did well in your first four years in the NFL. Like, when did you get that new contract, that big contract? When did that come through? Yeah, at the end of the four year rookie deal. And then I went to San Diego, got that. Uh, but then my life is just foreshadowing and full circle moments. Then I start getting hurt every year, surgery, every year, surgery. So I'm not getting better. I'm just rehabbing to get back to where I was while yep. others are progressing. Yep. And sooner than later, I hit that wall and I wasn't able to scale that one. Yeah, got it. And so how many years were you in when you feel like you hit that wall? I mean, I was hurt for my fourth year on. I had back yeah. surgery my fourth year, still bald. Fifth year, broke my foot, still bald. I kept balling, but I was, yeah. I could have been way better. <laughs> like yeah. people were like, yo, you're amazing. I was like, you have no idea. I am doing this on a broken foot, a back surgery, a torn abdominal wall, et cetera. So yeah. I, I should have just stopped. I had so much leverage 
And so I was so young, so much leverage and so much in front of me. I should have just said, until I'm perfect, I should have Kawhi Leonard did. Like, until I'm yeah. right, you ain't going to see me. And I still probably be playing right now. <laughs> yeah. And so how many years did you end up playing? A decade, 10 you years. You played 10 years. Nice. And then, yeah. and so when you were, when it was time to go, obviously you, you were fighting through a lot of stuff for six of those. Was it like, did it feel like, yeah, no. And again, you had this mindset of like, I'm playing football. I'm not a football player. Yeah. So did that stick with you when it was like time to go? It wasn't this brutal transition, but more just like, okay, that's been fun. It's good to go. Like, how did you feel about it? Yeah, it wasn't brutal. It, it was something I was looking forward to. Uh, there was a lot of fear of the unknown, kind of like, ah, right. uh, I don't know exactly what I'm going to do. Everyone kept telling me in the locker room, stay here, man. You Look how much money you get, all the fame. I was like, I'm done with this. You know I'm done with this. My best days are behind me. I've tried everything to get back. My body's broke down, beat up. Um, and I'm not into it the same. Your ego takes a hit. Your dedication looks different because you're not getting the results. So I was yeah. like, I'm not even built for this. I just did this because it was the fastest way to the top. Now yeah. let me do what I'm really built for, right? Yeah. And which is to help people and educate and, and be there in the different communities. So I looked at it differently than others. Yeah, no, that's fair. And so uh, you come out, what was the, what was, I want to say the plan. What did you fall into? I ended up falling into ESPN. Uh, yeah. I was already broadcasting. I was a correspondent for NFL Network while I was an active player. I had, I was the first Kardashian because I had my own reality show in Buffalo my rookie year. They just right. followed me around my house, my DJ studio, uh, me at the mall. So yeah. I always was around cameras and I love talking and educating and helping. I yeah. didn't care. I was an open book. Like people, yeah. the, the reporters come around. I wasn't the typical, yeah, it was a good game. Yeah, appreciate it. I was like, you know what happened on third down? Man, this dude was running. I was scared. I was, they were like, whoa, we love this dude. He's, that's how I am. So yeah. it, it, it opened up a lot of doors and relationships. I went to ESPN after retirement mm -hmm. and started working there and spent 11 years doing all the shows, hosting shows. Did that feel right? Like you said, you wanted to get into teaching was the idea. Did it feel like you were almost doing that and that was kind of fulfilling that other part? Yeah, because it was like a blend between, yeah. okay, I can educate people because 99% of the people have never played high-level football yeah. uh, or sports. And also, wow, I'm still around the game. Like, yeah. wait a minute. I'm at a football game wearing a suit, and they treat me better than all y'all players except the quarterback. <laughs> and, like, they moving people out the way, and I'm walking on the field, and people <laughs> – I'm like, I'm a star? And then people thought I was a better player because I was an authority or yeah. an expert. I'm like, wait a minute. Did y'all watch all my games? I wasn't that good, was I? <laughs> and it was just like, it was just like the total blend of the best of both worlds. And so 11 years there, what caused you to move on? More money, like everything. Yeah. <laughs> like, yeah. Uh, yeah, another opportunity. So I went from NFL Network to ESPN to Fox. Yeah. And yeah. it's just always like, I'm not scared to take on what's next or yeah the new challenge. I'm like, no, if I'm not into it, I'm not into it, man. Yeah. So I went to Fox and had an amazing time there. Four years at Fox. Then it was time to move on from there. And, and so when you moved on, what was next? Partnership, ownership, and also a change in media landscape. Like, you know, independence is going to be the new way. We see it already, the disruption uh, yeah. to linear cable, traditional media. Sports media took an ugly turn. They start rewarding people who were salacious. I don't like yeah. that. So, yeah. you know, instead of like arguing with them on their economic model, I go where the economic model supports me. And yeah. I just like talking about life through sports. And simple as that. I like to educate people and help them uh, know through my experiences, my, my failures and my successes. And then hopefully they could have their own vision and their own world of success. Fair. And so a couple more questions for you. Number one, what's next for you? What's, what's next, next for me? Yeah. Now is next for me. <laughs> my daddy told me one day, my dad told me one day I was overwhelmed. And overwhelmed just means you start adding up what you have to do and forgetting why you're doing it. So my dad educated yeah. me on me. So when people always got these plans, I just look at them like, I'm not the one. Like, I tell you what I'm doing now, and I'm going to do it better later, but it's not, I don't know what the hell is going to come next. Here's the thing. My dad said, how long is a marathon? I said, 26.2 miles. He's like, okay, take one step. Now, how long is a marathon? I said, ah, yeah, it ain't 26.2 no more. So what am I going to do next? I can tell you what I'm doing now. I'm a partner at Brinks TV, and I am the founder of Project Transition, my foundation, where we educate and empower the youth on their journey from 
diversity to affluence. So that's our mission statement. What we really do is let them kids know you can do anything in this world. Anything. And I am a living embodiment of that. So no excuses. You have to be greater than your greatest excuse. You don't believe me? Look at me. And now let's look at you. Awesome. Love that. So you got to go for a circle and really do exactly what you wanted to do when you were at Columbia. Exactly, man. Help people, man. That's what I'm built for. And last question that's right in line with that, for someone that does want to achieve greatness and is trying to figure out what is one thing I guess you wish you heard or you did hear that helped you really push through this and get through that adversity? Uh, I mean, it's really in here. Everything out there that you want is in here. Mark Twain said it best. Life's a competition between you and yourself. I think what this world suggests, I think a lot of people fall trapped to and victim to, is that they think it's out there. If I learn more, if I go do more, it doesn't matter. If you're trying to do that and haven't done this, that won't last. And probably you won't even attain that. You won't even get there because there's someone who has as much talent as you who also built this up. And if you've ever been on any basketball court, football field, when talent meets talent, what's next? (laughs) Plan B. And if your plan B is plan A, you in trouble, brother. So you better make sure you build yourself up so you can handle all these things. As we always say, you build up your hardware so in life you can apply any software. No matter what the issue, problem, circumstance, once you got that hardware built, this, you can handle anything out there. Love it. Well, Marcellus has been awesome. Thank you so much for coming on Hawk Talk. Did I do it right? (laughs) You got it. You got it. (laughs) I appreciate you, big dog. You too.